Senhoras e senhores, passamos neste momento alguns informes sobre a dinâmica da nossa programação no decorrer do dia. Ao final de cada painel, será promovido um breve debate sobre os temas abordados nas palestras proferidas. Foram disponibilizados formulários para perguntas na entrada do evento. Esses formulários devem ser encaminhados por meio da equipe de apoio ao moderador do debate. O moderador selecionará as perguntas dirigidas a cada palestrante. Pedimos a todos a compreensão para a observância dos tempos estipulados, considerando a ampla agenda prevista para o dia de hoje. Passamos, portanto, à apresentação do primeiro painel do dia, que traz como tema Tecnologias de Armazenamento de Energia, Estado da Arte e Propostas de Inovação. Para tanto, convidamos para sua apresentação o Dr. Jonathan Radcliffe, do Instituto de Energia da Universidade de Birmingham, Birmingham perdão, especialista em inovações tecnológicas, políticas e de mercado para a flexibilidade do sistema de energia. Jonathan Radcliffe produz estudos há 13 anos para o governo e o parlamento britânico, tendo o armazenamento de energia como seu principal foco de pesquisa. Good morning. Thank you. It's an uh, honor to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak and to the uh, Foreign Office of the British Government for organizing uh, this event. And as you've heard from uh, Sir David King and, and the rest of the panel, I think energy storage is really coming up the uh, political agenda and the scientific agenda at the same time. So it's a great opportunity now to see how we can really drive uh, some of the technologies uh, and, the, and, and the policies and markets around them uh, over the next few years uh, so that we can make a big difference uh, for the decarbonization uh, and increasing access to energy uh, globally. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, an overview of the work that we're doing in the UK, um, looking at some of the technology innovation, but, but also more widely around the system. Uh, and my, uh, my background is really uh, a bit mixed. I'm a physicist by training. Uh, and then I spent, uh, as you've heard, a, a number of years uh, working for the British government, and I worked for Sir David King uh, in the Government Office for Science uh, for a few years, uh, and then moved to the University of Birmingham, where I try and join up the, the technology side and the, and the policy side, um, because I think both are critical if, if we're really to deploy these technologies. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about the work that's going on around, around the innovation side, uh, but then also touch on uh, a, a short piece of work that we're doing for the Foreign Office looking at where some of the uh, commonalities between the UK and Brazil around energy and energy storage could help foster some collaboration uh, and see where we can take that forward because uh, I think there's, there's a great opportunity for, uh, for some countries where, where the technology is being developed to begin to deploy those and demonstrate them in, in different, different markets uh, and in different systems. Because, uh, as, as we'll see, uh, the, the technologies uh, can be applied to, to a number of different uh, scenarios. So just, just a quick advert for the Birmingham Energy Institute, but, but really it exemplifies, I think, how we need to meet some of these challenges uh, around energy. It, it doesn't come from one discipline, it comes from across disciplines. Uh, and you can see here how in Birmingham we're capturing uh, the academics from a number of different disciplines across the different schools and departments uh, to, to really try and engage uh, the, the widest possible set of stakeholders to, uh, to, to meet the challenges. So I, I think Sir, Sir David King has already laid out um, the, the, the UK's ambition uh, and we have a legislated target of reducing our emissions uh, by 80% by, by 2050 uh, on 1990 on levels. Uh, and so th this, this graph shows you that the, the, the sort of change that we've got to go through from uh, about current day where we're emitting 500 megatons of CO2 per year uh, and in 2050 it's got to drop to you know, a, a, fr a fraction of that. Uh, and, and this graph really shows how we, we take the carbon out of different sectors. And, and the important one for, for today is, is seeing how this purple... Uh, purple segment at the bottom, which represents electricity, uh, uh, comes out uh, of the system first. So we, we take the carbon out of electricity production and we use that electricity, that decarbonized electricity, in, uh, in a number of other sectors, including heat and transport. 
So, so that, that's the sort of scenario that, that we're working towards. So the, the emphasis now is on decarbonizing electricity. And th this graph from, from the national grid in the UK shows how we, uh, how we could go about that. So again, this is a scenario. It's not showing what we think exactly will happen or what should happen, uh, but, but it gives you an idea about s s some of the ways that, that we could meet that, that challenge. Essentially, so, so this goes out to 2035, so uh, in just about 20 years' time, and the black line shows the, uh, the carbon intensity of electricity production. So, so f following on from the previous graph, we've got to decarbonize almost completely the, the electricity sector uh, by, by the early 2030s. And in the UK, we're doing that uh, largely through replacing uh, a lot of coal uh, to start with in, in the, in the grey uh, segment uh, and increasing the, the amount of renewables uh, significantly from wind and, uh, and solar PV. Uh, so so that, that sort of uh, process is happening over the next five to ten years. Uh, and since, uh, since 2010 even, we've seen a, an exponential increase in the amount of uh, renewables from wind and solar uh, on, on the system. And by 2020, we'll, we could be at a point where over 50% of instantaneous power generation is coming from variable sources, uh, largely from, from wind, uh, but solar uh, has made uh, massive increases over the last two or three years. So, so we're seeing a, a lot of production and capacity coming from these intermittent and, and variable sources. And that, 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 that's going to increase our need uh, effectively for, for flexibility on the, on the electricity system. Uh, and that's going to uh, throw up a number of challenges uh, around uh, timescales that, that go, from, uh, go from seconds through to, through to months. And I've set them out here on, on the table on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, so thinking about what, when we get to a, a scenario what, where there is a lot of uh, renewables, variable renewables on the system, uh, over the period of, of a few seconds, uh, we're going to need to be wary of, the, uh, of frequency uh, and, and how that might change as, as, the, as the renewables cut in and out, uh, potentially with, uh, with wind or, or the sun uh, coming or going. Uh, and over the period of minutes, uh, as, the, as the power ramps up or ramps down, we need to, we need to compensate uh, for, for the renewables uh, from that side of things. How, how, do, we, how do we manage the system o over that sort of time scale? Uh, and then over hours, if we're looking at uh, the demand peaks, which typically happen uh, maybe for a few hours in the early evening uh, in the UK and in other systems, uh, could be during the middle of the day uh, when there's greatest demand for, uh, for air conditioning, for example. Then over hours and days, uh, as we can see uh, different uh, weather fronts moving through, uh, through the country, which could bring uh, windier or, or calmer weather. Uh, so, and, and, and that's something that we've got to be prepared for as well. And then what, what often is, is maybe not talked about quite so much is, is the seasonal variation. Uh, and in the UK, this is quite significant where heat uh, actually take, uh, is responsible for 40% of CO2 emissions uh, and about half of uh, our total energy consumption. And that varies between the summer and the winter very markedly. And, it, and it's actually quite a few times more in, in energy terms uh, than electricity demand. And if we're going to be shifting our heat from, uh, from natural gas, as we have now, through to electricity, decarbonized electricity, then we've got to think about, well, how are we going to produce uh, the right amount of uh, power just during the winter to meet uh, that heat demand uh, if, the, if, the, uh, if the capacity is going to be dormant for, for most of the rest of the year. So, so that, that's, uh, that, that's a challenge that really shows that we've got to think about the, the whole energy system uh, rather than just think about specifically electricity on its own. And, and I think that goes for... Uh, other countries as well. Uh, it might not be heat, it might be cooling uh, in, in, in different countries. And so we, we, we need this greater flexibility uh, and energy storage, uh, as, as you'll be aware, is, is a technology that, that can help provide that. It's, it's not the only technology, 
uh, and we can think of demand side response uh, as uh, as providing quite a lot of uh, help on, on that side of things or increasing transmission and interconnection or, or indeed having more uh, more variable generation uh, from uh, uh, from more responsive uh, uh, nuclear or, or CCS for example but energy storage it is really showing itself to be a sort of technology uh, that can sit on the system uh, and work very effectively um, at, at a number of different scales and uh, across the different time scales and in different places also as we've heard. So th this, this graph really shows that, that the range of different technologies because energy storage is, isn't just a single technology, it's, it's more of a family uh, of, of different sorts of uh, processes uh, that, that go from uh, electrochemical uh, through to thermal uh, and, and pure electrical uh, storage technologies that, that take us across those different uh, time scales uh, from the seconds uh, up, up through, through to the hours and days and, and months. So on the left hand side uh, it gives you the power rating uh, that the technology that the different technologies can, can deliver uh, and, and the time over which they can deliver that technology. So th th there's a big range and, and we hear mostly about the, uh, the batteries that, that sit uh, over sort of minutes and hours at the moment uh, and delivering, delivering uh, up to a few, a few megawatts of, of, uh, of power. Uh, but th there's a number of different technologies that might be more suitable to, to different applications uh, and I think that was one of the messages that, that we just heard from, from the introductions here. It's about seeing what, what different technologies could fit I into, into different, uh, different possibilities. Uh, and so the, 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 the most common one at the moment is the pumped hydro storage, uh, which is about 99% of all deployed energy storage technology, which you can see in the top right-hand corner. But then coming down, the, there are these new ones around compressed air energy storage, perhaps using hydrogen uh, as a storage technology, uh, and liquid air energy storage, which we're developing at the University of Birmingham uh, that, that I'll touch on. So... Yeah, we, we can see that the challenges, uh, we can see that there are some technologies to, to meet those challenges. Uh, so, so why aren't things happening? I, and I think that's really uh, what, what I want to drive towards now. And the, uh, the, the UK uh, government commissioned uh, the, the National Infrastructure Commission that, that was set up last year uh, by the Conservative government to, to look at uh, a number of different topics, including transport and energy. Uh, and it reported just before... Uh, the, the budget that was, uh, that was a few weeks ago uh, and it, it produced this uh, report called Smart Power which is really looking at how do we, how do we uh, meet some of those challenges uh, and, and you can see that one of its central findings uh, is that uh, three innovations, interconnection, storage and demand flexibility could save the consumers £8 billion a year. So th th there's a lot a uh, lot of money at stake here and, and we could run the energy system much more efficiently if we have the right technologies uh, to, to deploy. So, so that was last year but you can also look back uh, 15, 15 years uh, when we had the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution which was one of the first bodies uh, in the UK to set out uh, the, the sort of targets that, that we need to be meeting and, and how we might meet those carbon targets with, with, uh, with renewable technologies. Uh, and it reported uh, in, in 2000, again, that the government needs to stimulate uh, solving these problems that large-scale intermittency and embedded generation would pose uh, as a matter of urgency. So this was in 2000, and it recommended the government promote R&D into, into large-scale energy storage. So it, it, feels, it feels that I think that, that was probably a little bit too early uh, to really have any effect the, the uh, renewable technologies weren't deployed at that stage, they were still rising up uh, and so the market wasn't really there to pull them through. However much money we put into the R&D, uh, if, if, if you don't have the market uh, that, that will attract private investment into the technology, then, then uh, I think you're in a really difficult place. So I think that's the critical point that we're at now. Uh, we, we have the intermittent uh, technologies delivering power, uh, we need to create the market that can bring the technologies uh, through uh, and, and into deployment. And so I, I try to classify the, the barriers to deployment of, of storage uh, across, these, uh, across these different areas, six, six different areas. Well, one of them 
is for sure around the technology cost and performance, that the costs are too high uh, and the performance isn't quite there in terms of the, uh, the number of life cycles uh, that, can be, uh, that can be delivered. But, but it goes wider than that. Uh, there the, are the a number of non-technological barriers that, that, that need to be uh, overcome as well. And I, I won't go through all of them in, in detail, but it's thinking about uh, really how, how that value, the, the system value uh, that is there uh, for energy storage can be captured uh, and really monetized so that, um, so that it, it, it can be deployed into a market environment. So it, it thinks about the uncertainty of the value. Uh, and, and I suppose this is one thing about storage. You, you wouldn't put storage on, on the system unless you really needed it. Uh, we, we only have it there because we're going to have renewables, variable renewables. Uh, if you don't have those variable renewables, then you don't really need energy storage. So uh, it is quite dependent on that pathway being followed. But then once you've got these new technologies, they're, they're quite disruptive. Uh, they don't really uh, run to the sort of uh, business models that the traditional generation or demand side technologies uh, normally follow. So you, you have you have complications uh, around, around the business models, capturing different revenue streams, whether the, the markets are really set up um, to, uh, to, to allow different technologies to uh, capture the, the, the value that is there on the system, uh, but might actually be taken away by, by other policies or, uh, or technologies. And then the regulatory and policy framework, as there are restrictions on ownership of storage as it can be classified as, as, a, uh, as a generation technology. And, and so whether network companies are allowed to own and operate them is, is a contentious issue. And, and we mustn't forget about some of the wider societal issues as well. Um, as uh, you know, people, uh, or, or, although we, we, can see, we can see the technologies as being perfectly safe, if they're new, uh, then people will, will have concern to if, if they're being, be, uh, being deployed. So it's, it, it goes across the range, really, that, that, that we need to be uh, looking at uh, um, to, to really get to the maximum uh, efficiency. And I'll, I'll just mention quickly uh, a project that, that is getting underway uh, that, that I'm involved in, uh, being led by University College London uh, in the UK, uh, as, as it's particularly applicable to, uh, to, to this audience and, and where we are today. Um, looking at some of the uh, regulatory barriers. So, so th this is quite early work and it's really just to advertise that, uh, that, that it's ongoing uh, and that we'll be producing a paper uh, over the next couple of months so that goes into a bit more detail uh, around these regulatory barriers and, and thinking about some exogenous regulatory barriers that um, if, you can, uh, if you can tackle, uh, it, it won't be, sorry, it's not too clear on, on this slide, but, but there's a number of exogenous barriers which if you can... Uh, if you can tackle, uh, then it removes a lot of the other, other barriers, uh, the, the, the multiple barriers that, that exist uh, that, that um, sort of uh, you know, don't, don't allow the, the full system value to, to be exploited by energy storage. So th this sort of approach by, by seeing where some of those key barriers are, attacking them, uh, and that really opens, opens the doors to, to, more, uh, to more deployment. Uh, so, so this is a project uh, called Restless. Uh, realize, realizing energy storage technologies uh, that just got underway last year. So we'll be producing some papers uh, over the next uh, couple of months so that look at these, uh, is, these issues to start with. And then it will be running for, for the next three years. So uh, away from the uh, sort of non-technical barriers, but yeah, we're also interested in, in the technology innovation as well. Uh, and the UK government uh, has been very keen to uh, see energy storage as one in which we can uh, get a lot of benefit from for the energy system, but, but also uh, for, the, for the industry in the UK, as we have a number of companies that, that are uh, quite, uh, quite far ahead in, in deploying some of these or demonstrating some of these technologies. And it was set out as one of the eight great technologies uh, in, in 2013. Uh, and, and it's received support from uh, right across the, the innovation process from uh, the, the basic research uh, in the universities uh, where a lot of money has gone into new capital equipment and test beds that, that I'll quickly mention uh, around program funding uh, to, to do the sort of research that, that you've seen from, from Restless and a number, number of other quite significant projects. Um, 
and then going through to the uh, develop and demonstrate phase of the technology. So first of all, the, the research to develop some new technologies and then start to put those into real, uh, real systems uh, that, that you can demonstrate that are being funded uh, by Innovate UK uh, and the Energy Technologies, Technologies Institute, which are big f public funders uh, in the UK for, for that side of things. And then through, th through to the demonstration of larger scale devices uh, by, the, uh, by the government department for energy and climate change uh, and, and the regulator indeed, Ofgem in the UK through its low carbon network fund and, and network innovation competition. And, and I think it's interesting to see how, how the UK regulator has, has recognized that innovation uh, is an important part of its role uh, in delivering lower cost uh, systems to consumers. So the, the, the companies need uh, a bit of stick and a bit of carrot uh, to, uh, to drive them in that, in that direction, because over the longer term, as we go through these new scenarios, then uh, the, the new technologies will deliver that, uh, that more efficient system. So it's, it's quite a wide, uh, wide ranging uh, innovation program that, that, that we have in the UK. And you can see the, uh, the increase uh, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So this is just looking at the re research support for, for energy storage and really how, how small it was uh, at, at the beginning of the century, al almost, almost negligible, uh, and really risen very rapidly over the last uh, five or 10 years. So we're, we're, uh, it's nice for me to be uh, a part of that community because we're, uh, we're reaping some of the rewards, but, but they, as you've seen, you know, per perhaps, perhaps they've been a bit bit overdue. So what, one of the big programs that we have uh, is called the Energy Superstore, uh, which is the UK's Energy Storage Research Hub, uh, which is a £4 million project over, over five, five years led by the University of Oxford and uh, Professor Peter Bruce there. Um, and, and, and that's really uh, acting as the, as the place where a lot of the different projects can interact and bringing the community together. Uh, so th there's a couple of websites at the bottom uh, there where you can find out more details. But the, the, the activities go across the technology space uh, from flow batteries uh, through to uh, electrochemical, lithium ion, lithium air, through to the larger scale thermal storage and, and compressed air and a number of cross-cutting programs as well. And I, I've got a role as part of that project to develop a national roadmap for energy storage, which is looking at both how the technologies might change over the next 15 to 20 years in terms of their cost and performance, but how the rest of the system and the regulation and policy aspects will change as well to see uh, what, what, what needs to be, what interventions need to be made uh, to, to, get to, the, uh, to get to the most efficient system. So, so that's something that, that we'll be reporting uh, by, by this summer and give some guidance as, as to what the priorities need to be as, as we drive forward uh, energy storage. And I, I'm also leading a project called, called Manifest, and, and, and this is building on the, the, the large capital uh, equipment spend that, that the government put in uh, a couple of years ago, which is looking across the, across the scales from, uh, from the very micro scale of, of how, uh, how batteries work and how they degrade uh, up to the pilot scale test beds that, that, that have been put in place. And this shows you... Uh, that, that five uh, quite significant test beds were deployed uh, under, under that capital equipment program uh, in, in each of these different universities. Uh, and, and what we're planning to do is, is get the operational data from those test beds, which are uh, on, on the network uh, and will be running over the next four years, and begin to bring some of that together so we can really understand how energy storage operates on systems uh, how it degrades over years, uh, and how it can respond to different market signals. So we're, we're, we'll be capturing that in a, in a UK observatory for energy storage facilities. And to look in a bit more detail at just one of those that, that we're doing in, in Birmingham. So this is the uh, test bed that we have around liquid air energy storage. Uh, and I, I, I won't go into the, uh, into the technology in detail, but just to say it, it uses off-peak electricity to liquefy the air. So bring it down to about minus 200 degrees centigrade, or 77 Kelvin. Uh, gets liquefied just, just behind here. Gets stored in a big white tank. Uh, so it's about 40 
uh, 40 tons of liquid nitrogen. Uh, and then when you want the electricity back, you bring it up to ambient temperature or you use waste heat. You get a massive expansion from the liquid into a gas of 700 times and that turns a turbine and, and uh, generates the electricity for you. And, and so that, that, that's an example of, of where we'll be using, we'll, we'll be capturing the operational data and, and storing it and, and allowing others uh, from the UK, from the academic and industrial community to, to learn from it. And the, uh, the company that's developing it, Highview Power Storage, uh, it's developing, a, a t well, it's building, almost built, uh, a 20 megawatt plant uh, near Manchester. The, the one that we have in, in Birmingham is 300 kilowatts uh, and runs for, for eight hours. And just thinking more widely about the system, um, you have the liquid nitrogen, it can provide cooling, uh, and by, by the middle of the century, uh, we can see that air conditioning will actually overtake uh, the amount of energy needed uh, rather than heating. Uh, so if we, can, if we can think about the system, again, it's not just about electricity, it's thinking about either heat and cold and power all together about how we can deliver a more efficient system. And you know, th this has got resonances uh, in the UK, but also in, in developing countries where there's a lot of food wastage uh, because the refrigeration isn't there to take food from, from, the, from the farmer uh, to the market. So if we can develop smarter ideas around, around using uh, energy and cold, then we can have wider benefits uh, that, that, um, yeah, that, that, that can have big societal advantages. So just quickly, I'll, I'll have a look at some of the work that, that we're doing on uh, energy storage between UK and Brazil, and I particularly look forward to, uh, to this day to, to help inform the work that, that we're doing around this so that we can see some opportunities for, for collaboration. Uh, and it's partly around seeing what the different challenges are between the UK and, and Brazil, uh, but, but how similar technologies might, might, uh, might be suited to, to both those systems. So th this gives you a bit of a historical uh, trend for, for the UK. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got the total primary energy, uh, which has been uh, Coal is, is at the bottom, and that, that's been de declining over the last few decades, uh, as, has, as has oil. Uh, gas, natural gas, uh, really increased in, in the early 1990s as we used it for, for power generation uh, much more. But what's interesting is that you can see the, uh, the, the total primary energy uh, actually dropping uh, over, over about, about the last 10 years, partly uh, due to the recession, partly due to energy efficiency, partly due to offshoring some of our industrial uh, man and manufacturing uh, capability. So our, our, our trend has been downwards, and you can see this also in, in electricity, which is on the right-hand side, uh, which has been declining over the last few years as well. Now, looking at uh, Brazil, and again, as, as we've just heard, it's, it's quite the opposite. So this is uh, the, the very rapid rise, again, in total primary en energy supply, and, and electricity, um, so you're, you're heading upwards, and, and a lot of countries are heading upwards. You know, if, if we're looking at China and India, uh, coming from coming from different technologies, and it's it's, it's thinking about you know, what, what those technologies are going to be in the future, and being prepared for those different scenarios. So lo looking at looking at now, um, really just to emphasise for for the UK, energy end use. Uh, about 50% is for heat, uh, and a, another big chunk is, is for transport. So when we're thinking about energy storage and we're thinking about energy, we, we need to think about more than just electricity storage. Energy uh, thermal storage can, can play a big role. And, and again, for Brazil, it's about thinking about what the energy is being used for. Uh, if you have electricity, you know, what, 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 what's the end use of it? Because there might be more efficient ways of actually providing the service from energy. Uh, and you know, that, that can shape whether you're thinking about developing uh, thermal energy technologies or electrical energy technologies and, and where you might place those on the system. And as, so, so this is looking just at electricity uh, profiles. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got for uh, Great Britain, GB, uh, which is the, the islands of England, Scotland, and uh, Wales. 
uh, and, and the different seasons. So winter uh, is, is on top. Uh, it's higher than, than in the summer, and you get this pronounced peak uh, in the early tea time. And, and so th this is th those few hours that, that, that we need to be uh, thinking about that, that, that I was talking, talking about earlier, and, and how we can use energy storage to help overcome that problem of, of, of peaking plants that, that is just there for a few hours a day. For, for Brazil, yeah, and again, you know, it, it's slightly different. Um, your summer demand is higher, uh, driven by, uh, uh, by different uses, uh, and, and the sort of shape of it is, is different as well. So it, the, by, by, by considering the, the different uh, systems, uh, we can see where energy storage might fit within those systems uh, best to, to get the most efficient uh, end, end point. You, uh, and so looking ahead for, for the UK, uh, I won't go into these in detail because I've, I've shown you really the, the, the general plan for, for the UK uh, and how we're moving towards decarbonised electricity uh, and using that for, for more heat and transport uses later on. But for, for Brazil, I'd, I'd be interested really in, in today but also from, uh, from any other contributions around what, what the scenarios are for the future 15 or 20 years because I think it's, it's that looking ahead trying to take that long view and being prepared uh, that, that can really guide innovation uh, now. Uh, and so we, we've picked up a, a couple, of, couple of different scenarios uh, from PDE and, and the IEA uh, to look at uh, 2035 scenarios uh, and how electricity and energy might be, uh, might be demanded at those, at those times and, and in which sectors. So I'm uh, sort of running out of time, so I'll uh, I'll, I'll skip through some of these, but uh, so this really just shows the, uh, the different seasonal variation uh, going, going out to 2035. Okay, five minutes, I'll, uh, I'll hit that. Um, so energy storage potential, so lo looking at electricity, we're, we're, we're constructing this sort of framework as, as to how we understand different systems. Uh, and again, I'm so, sorry you won't be able to see, but this is a sort of spider diagram uh, which looks at different, um, different drivers for, uh, for energy storage, uh, from, from bulk energy storage, for ancillary services, transmission and distribution uh, pressures uh, for the customer, and for renewables integration. And looking at trying to see how different systems uh, have different pulls towards each of those axes. And you can see for, from our, our analysis um, how important renewable integration is, is for the UK, uh, but uh, for transmission and distribution uh, efficiency, uh, we can see that there are some great strides there that, that can be helped by, by energy storage. If, if we look at Brazil, given, given the makeup of the electricity generation, and uh, with so much of it coming from, from hydro, uh, that, that actually gives you a, a very responsive electricity system. So th there's going to be different ways in which uh, storage can, uh, can benefit, benefit the system. So it's probably not so much from ancillary services because you, ha you have uh, you know, sufficient of that from the hydro. But if you think about getting that power from, from the hydro plant to the consumer at the right time and at the right place, uh, then yeah, we're, we're, got, we're really thinking about some of the network uh, pressures uh, that, that, will be, uh, that, we be f that will be felt. So energy storage could be that sort of buffer uh, at maybe the local level or um, sort of uh, lower voltage near, near the consumer uh, that, that can help, uh, help, help the power to, to be, uh, to be uh, supplied to the customer w when it's demanded rather than just when it's being produced. Uh, and again, I, w I won't really go through these, but just trying to think about the, the, the market size of, of each of those uh, different segments, whether it's the bulk ancillary distribution and renewable integration, trying to get a feel for, for what some of those figures are. So again, I'll uh, be looking forward to, to hearing some of the uh, presentations today to, uh, to sort of ground truth some of these and, and again, uh, be happy to uh, d uh, dis uh, discuss with you in more detail what, what we're looking at at the moment. So the same goes for thermal uh, and I, I think we can see ways in which thermal storage can play a big role in both the systems uh, and, and looking at the, the opportunities for the UK, that there's a demand for heat, but there's also a lot of waste heat from industrial processes and power plants that, that, that we can capture. For, the, for Brazil, around solar water heating 
and, and air conditioning, what, what some of those sort of energy uh, scales are. So there's a lot of research capability uh, in the UK, Brazil. This is looking at electricity, uh, energy storage, uh, and, where, and how that is, is spread across the, the different universities. Uh, and, and this is really just the, the, this is the number of publications that, that have been, uh, been found but, uh, over the last five years. Uh, and in thermal energy storage, where, where the UK has got quite a lot of capability, uh, and we, we couldn't really find very much going on in Brazil, so, so that might be a good area for, for us to uh, work, work a bit more closely. Um, I won't go through some of the, uh, the, the SWOT analysis that we've done in the interest of time, but to think about where, where some of the opportunities are uh, for us to work together across the large scale in different technologies, uh, through to the small scale heat and cooling uh, and for uh, electric vehicles as well. And as, as we've heard from Sir David King and the other speakers, international collaboration is going to be critical for this. It, it's too big for one country to do. We've all got the challenges uh, so we can all, all benefit. And one minute to go, so just finishing on, on the final slide uh, around the recommendations. Uh, we need to think about the system uh, and how that's going to change over the next uh, 15, 20 uh, and more years so that we make the right choices over the short term to avoid the, that longer scale, uh, longer time scale lock-in if, if we make the wrong choices, either in generation or, or in network infrastructure. We can help this by constructing uh, roadmaps uh, which don't really set out a prescriptive route to, to any particular future but really try and describe what some of the choices and what the options will be over the next uh, 15 or 20 years uh, in, in, a, in a very dynamic fashion. Uh, and we need the research collaboration for the technologies, drive down the cost, improve the performance. And I think really, you know, if, we can, if we can start using uh, you know, different markets to demonstrate those technologies, uh, then we'd be extremely keen to come to Brazil uh, see some of the, uh, uh, the, the encouragement that, 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 that we're hearing uh, and see how we can find new markets for the technologies that, that have been developed working with academia, industry and, and public bodies uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, happy to take questions during the day or, or discuss, uh, discuss with you individually. Thank you. Dando sequência às apresentações deste painel, eu convido agora para sua apresentação o gerente de marketing industrial da Parker Harnifin Corporation, o senhor Steven Schwartz, e o presidente da Associação Brasileira de Armazenamento e Qualidade de Energia, o senhor Carlos Leite Brandão. Steven Schwartz lidera a equipe da Parker, dedicada ao desenvolvimento de equipamentos de armazenamento, especialmente os voltados para energias renováveis. Carlos Leite Brandão trabalhou 25 anos na CEMIG, onde fez parte do corpo de diretores. Foi presidente da Comissão de Auditoria da Câmara de Comércio em Energia Elétrica e fez parte da diretoria do Operador Nacional do Sistema. Bom dia, uma correção. Eu fui do conselho do ANS, tá? não da diretoria do ANS. Okay. É, primeiro, eu queria é, cumprimentar a todos e queria cumprimentar, começando aqui, a diretoria da ANEL e pedindo a, que levasse os cumprimentos para o doutor Romeu. Queria cumprimentar a equipe da SPE, na pessoa do Máximo e nos colegas da SPE, Carmen, Elton, Fábio, eu não sei se eu estou esquecendo alguém, Aurélio. Na minha idade, a gente permite duas coisas. Primeiro, parar em estacionamento prioritário em shopping, depois esquecer alguns nomes. Então, é, queria cumprimentar aqui também o, o presidente do Conselho de Administração da ABAC, Jim Hart, que está aqui com a gente, colega diretor de tecnologia e mercado, Alexandre, vários associados, 
alguns associados, inclusive a, a, o Steven, daqui a pouco nós vamos escutá-los. Queria é, cumprimentar o adito comercial dos Estados Unidos, a Andre Gatley, da Embaixada, e o adito de Energias e Recursos Naturais, Paul Giotto, que permitiram a participação em vídeo, já que estava apertada a participação hoje à tarde do pessoal do FERC. E, nesse momento, eu queria é, passar algumas palavras para os senhores a respeito de como nós estamos vendo o processo de armazenamento de energia. É, nós cumprimentamos muito ao pessoal é, da ANEL, na pessoa do Máximo, a o sucesso desse evento. É só olhar para trás, a gente vai ver um auditório tremendamente lotado, numa época conturbada de várias preocupações dentro do setor elétrico e fora do setor elétrico, mas isso mostra perfeitamente que nós estamos tendo sucesso em olhar para frente. A ANEL, ao promover isso, ela coloca um passo à frente na discussão do setor elétrico. Com tantos problemas, a gente ainda consegue ver o futuro é, que não é visto só nesse evento, mas é uma história recente. O armazenamento de energia foi colocado na agenda do setor elétrico brasileiro em meados do ano passado. Até naquele momento era uma coisa que não passava de, um simples, é, de uma simples hipótese. E o mais interessante é que o Brasil foi um dos pioneiros em armazenamento de energia. Ele teve, em 1939 a primeira usina reversível do mundo, que está, inclusive, no banco de dados do DOE americano. Em 1939, o Brasil inaugurou a usina reversível de pedreiras. E deitamos em berço esplêndido e nunca mais tivemos um projeto em armazenamento de energia. Em nenhuma de suas tecnologias, nem mesmo dando continuidade a usinas em Pumped eh, Hydro, que nós tínhamos começado naquele momento. Essa agenda é, de armazenamento de energia recolocada no setor elétrico ano passado se mostrou com muito sucesso em função de vários eventos promovidos, é, seja pela associação e fora da associação, e que culmina agora com o um workshop da ANEL, que mais uma vez eu cumprimento a ANEL por essa iniciativa, em que a gente tem a oportunidade de discutir via um programa de P&D, não só tecnologias, mas principalmente as aplicações de tecnologias e os procedimentos para adotar uma moldura regulatória de uso de armazenamento de energia, antes do medidor e depois do medidor. Dentro desse ambiente, eu gostaria de fazer uma reflexão. É, no dia 27 de agosto, nós marcamos com o primeiro evento a o nascimento da associação da ABAC. E, naquele momento, nós temos aqui alguns números de quantos projetos existiam no mundo em termos de armazenamento de energia. Nós estamos falando de coisas de mais ou menos seis meses. No segundo momento, nós tivemos um outro evento com grande repercussão na Faria Lima, em São Paulo, em que, no dia 5 de novembro, nós já tínhamos mais ou menos 100, mais 100 projetos em relação àquilo que foi de agosto. E no dia 31 de março, hoje, no lançamento do processo da ANEL, nós temos 1.475 projetos. Isso ao redor do mundo. Aliás, eu gostaria de convidá-los a visitar esse banco de dados, que é disponibilizado pelo DOE americano, que tem todos os projetos, inclusive por, é, por tipo de uso, é, por tipo de investimento, assim por diante. O que chama a atenção é que todos esses projetos se desenvolvem com uma velocidade muito grande. Velocidades em todas as tecnologias e para diversas aplicações. A fase mais questionável dessa discussão está na relação de custo-benefício. É, o ano passado, um estudo detalhado americano colocou isso em fluxo de caixa com considerações a respeito de custos mensais de operação, em relação a é, é, tempo útil de cada tipo de equipamento, e chegou à conclusão que vários dos processos de armazenamento de energia são viáveis comercialmente e competem com processos convencionais, sem falar das vantagens que esses sistemas de armazenamento têm, quer seja para o grid, 
que seja para funções em termos de consumidor. Por que, que isso chama atenção? Porque muitas vezes a falta de conhecimento desses estudos é que levam a um adiamento da tomada de decisão que isso ainda não é viável. Esses projetos, independente de incentivos, já têm sua viabilidade comprovada, inclusive com alguns projetos já tendo andamento a nível de Brasil. Bom, é, talvez essa seja a minha primeira palestra, que não é uma palestra eminentemente técnica a respeito de storage. Nós vamos ter aqui a oportunidade de escutar tecnologias, é, de escutar regulamentações, coisas do gênero. Agora, é importante destacar os desafios que o Brasil tem que vencer em relação a isso. Primeiro, na cadeia de produção industrial. Esse é um problema de criar um processo de produção industrial num primeiro momento, de criar uma perspectiva de curto e médio prazo de implantação de diversas tecnologias no Brasil e de alimentar uma cadeia de pesquisa em relação a isso. Outro problema não menos importante é todo o procedimento de regulamentação para além do medidor e antes do medidor, em especial uma discussão a respeito das quantificações e benefícios que isso traz no sistema, que vai de postergação de investimento em distribuição e transmissão, a venda de serviços ancilares para controle de frequência e outras coisas, a discussão que hoje está sendo feita no Brasil em termos de geração intermitente, da entrada de eólicas, da entrada de solar. Isso o Brasil está bastante adiantado em entender dos seus próprios problemas, mas são desafios que só vão ser vencidos a partir do momento que essa discussão tiver a oportunidade de ser capitaneada, como a ANEL está fazendo nesse momento. Então, eu não vou me deter nesse processo dos desafios brasileiros, mas gostaria de explicitar uma preocupação que nós temos, de que nesse momento, várias dessas tecnologias são amadurecidas tecnologicamente e comercialmente falando. E o que nos falta é entender a forma de aplicação, a quantificação dos benefícios que elas nos traz e criar uma moldura regulatória vencendo barreiras que existem e assim existe em qualquer lugar, já foi mostrado aqui anteriormente, para que isso possa ter uma aplicação generalizada. Nós estaremos divulgando, talvez ainda em abril, a, o nosso primeiro é, estudo de mercado. Esse estudo de mercado está classificado em diversos nichos, e se alguém que, quiser, depois a gente pode discutir um pouquinho a respeito disso. E nós estamos chegando a uma conclusão extremamente interessante. Tirando fora a parte de serviço ancilar, que é uma coisa que depende para ter projeção de mercado, de regulamentação, expectativa de oportunidade, o Brasil tem uma capacidade de aproximadamente 90 gigawatts em condições de colocar armazenamento de energia elétrica num, curto, num prazo de 5 a 10 anos. Esse número está calcado em estudo detalhado por nichos de mercado. Por exemplo, por obrigação... O Brasil tem 1.500 hospitais com CTI que, por uma certa lei que eu tenho ela aqui, é obrigado a ter geração de emergência. E isso já dá um grande mercado. Nós temos de 7 a 9 gigawatts em geradores térmicos espalhados em diversas condições de operação, que inclusive hoje são usados para fazer co é, corte de ponta no, do consumidor, que também tem um grande potencial. Numa conversa com Barata, no Ministério de Minas e Energia, é, nós acertamos um processo de entendimento a respeito de atendimento de sistemas isolados com fotovoltaica. Esse é um mercado tremendo que a gente tem guardado, inclusive, as, as preocupações em relação a colocar isso em, em, em lugares agressivos, etc. E tal. Então, é de impressionar que o Brasil hoje tem um mercado de 90 gigawatts hora, nós estamos falando aqui de energia, em diversos nichos de, é, de negócio. E, mais uma vez, não estão incluídos aqui serviços ancilares, uma vez que isso depende de uma série de estudos para a resposta ao sistema. Bom, 
É, só para terminar, nós temos aqui uma série de expectativas em relação ao que, que esses projetos de P&D vão nos trazer. Tá? É, uma série de desafios regulatórios, isso aí está na apresentação, a gente depois pode discutir, mais uma vez, enfatizando a preocupação com as barreiras. É, o ano passado, uma pesquisa mostrou que para mais de 500 executivos americanos, armazenamento de energia é o grande business. Tá? E eu gostaria de deixar uma última mensagem. Há uma diferença muito grande daquilo que ocorreu em telecomunicação e aquilo que ocorreu em energia no mundo. Tá? Nós estamos, talvez, agora no limiar de mudar essa, essa tecnologia, tá? em que nós passaríamos a ter o mesmo tipo de competição, é, ditado pelo anseio do consumidor de redução de preço e de oportunidades de democratização, como foi a uberização e o WhatsApp em telecomunicações. Finalmente, nós estamos agora levando uma delegação brasileira para Charlotte, para a feira e exposição, feira e exposição da 26ª, não é primeira nem segunda, 26ª feira e exposição e armazenamento de energia, com a nossa parceira a Energy Stories Association, Estamos montando uma delegação para visitar a Califórnia durante a Solar Power International, que vai ser em Las Vegas, e depois nós vamos visitar instalações e os commissioners na Califórnia. Estamos montando também para esse ano um seminário sobre regulamentação e armazenamento. Obrigado. Steve. Welcome, everybody. My name is Steve Schwartz. I'm a uh, industry market manager for Parker Hannifin. Uh, this is my first trip to Brazil, so I'm kind of new as to what's going on in the market, but uh, I have spent the week with our sales staff here and uh, have learned a lot about the uh, country, the opportunities, and look forward to sharing a little bit about uh, an overview of what we're doing in the States as far as energy storage and what Parker Hannifin uh, may know, as well as uh, what's going on in the market. I'm going to be doing a little bit of a basic background, a little history, and kind of go over some things that many of you might already know, but may be helpful to others. Um, what we're seeing in the market right now still is uh, pumped hydro. Pumped hydro is the major um, provider of energy storage in the market. But what we're seeing is a dynamic uh, market in revolving around new technologies. For example, uh, we're seeing uh, compressed air still in the market, uh, flywheels. And uh, batteries is kind of a new um, energy storage technology that's coming to the market. Um, in about 2008, we had the first megawatt-sized energy storage platform being introduced into the U.S. market. It was used for frequency regulation. Uh, Parker Hannifin was a part of that, um, as well as AES. Going through this a little bit, uh, I want to talk a little bit, too, about uh, some of the um, challenges and some of the applications as it relates to these technologies. Uh, pump type drill, again, has been around for a long time. Uh, it actually started in about 1890s. Uh, basically, you're looking at a reservoir at a high altitude, a reservoir at a low altitude. During the day when generation is expensive, we simply bring it, the water down, generate power, And then at night, when the, water, the electricity is cheaper, we pump the water back up. Uh, the system is very uh, conducive to, or, or limited, I should say, uh, in regards to the location. Uh, there's not that many geographic locations where you can actually put one of these facilities. So it becomes a little bit of a challenge. There's also efficiencies uh, that's an issue. This is about a 75%, 85% efficient system, or 80% efficient system. But once built, these systems can last for a long time. Compressed air is uh, another technology that's being used in the market. Uh, traditionally, uh, this is uh, actually, from a historic standpoint, it's been around for a long time as well. Uh, the first major compressed air uh, installation uh, took place in 1978. Uh, the system was upgraded in about 2006, has about 321 megawatts. Uh, there's also another facility in Alabama uh, that's about 110 megawatts. 
Uh, these systems take a little time to operate. Uh, once you find a, um, an air cavity, if you will, a cavern, maybe this is a salt dome that's been uh, excavated or taken the salt out. Um, these areas are available for uh, putting in compressed air. Um, there, this technology is existing. Uh, the challenge is, in, in large part, and we've had a number of, of test trials here in the, in the states, uh, and the problem has been primarily in certifying, getting permits, uh, making sure that the cavern can handle the uh, air capacity or the air uh, pressure. Uh, another issue with this is uh, when you compress the air, you create a lot of heat, so there's some inefficiencies involved with the technology. Um, flywheels is another technology that's come to market. Uh, this is one of the first technologies used primarily in the states for frequency regulation other than generation, uh, other than nor normal uh, power plants. Uh, in this scenario, uh, these systems are mechanical devices. They're uh, highly, they spin very fast. Um, usually they've got a steel um, center shaft that spins very fast at around 10,000 RPMs. Some of the newer systems are now using some kind of a carbon, um, high, high strength carbon um, uh, material. Uh, the, or the efficiencies on these are, are fairly good, uh, long life. Uh, many of the newer, or the, the systems were actually, whoops, sorry. Many of these systems were actually uh, built into, gra into the ground in concrete bunkers. Uh, because there is a lot of potential energy when these things are flying around and if there is a problem with something, uh, there can be an issue. Uh, battery technology is one of the new technologies that we're seeing a lot of in the states. Um, and large part of that is that we can now um, build these systems into containers and move the containers to wherever they're needed. It could be on a transmission system, could be on distribution, could be closer to the load. And I'll talk a little bit about more about that in the future. Uh, but the key, key issue here, primarily, is that I've got to figure out how to use the uh, pointer on this. Um, but basically, um, these are systems that can be pretty much used anywhere. Um, batteries, for the most part, a lot of the lithium batteries, for example, will have a shorter life period. They're about 10 years, but they can either be oversized or the technology is now such that the costs are coming down sufficiently that at some point in the future, they can be replaced at a lower cost. Uh, thanks to Jonathan, we've already seen this slide. Uh, so uh, here we're really talking about different technologies having different capacities, different um, grid problems that energy storage is being used for, uh, requires different technologies for them. They're, each one is a little bit different, and I want to try and talk about that uh, here in a little bit. So we've got pumped hydro, we've got compressed air. These are long life systems, can you be used for many hours. We've got batteries, we've got flywheels. Flywheels uh, really only, uh, most of the older technology for flywheels, uh, those systems, the uh, energy storage would only be used for a few seconds, few minutes, uh, and so forth. Some of the applications. Um, primarily what we're seeing in the United States is a lot of use of frequency regulation. Uh, PJM, one of the operating companies in the States, have been using uh, battery power for frequency regulation, largely due to the fact that uh, the batteries are much more efficient in operating rather than generation. The regulatory um, industry in, in the U.S. has allowed for payments to be made to given, given companies. With those payments, uh, they're able to now fund projects to build these power plants, energy storage power plants, if you will. Uh, and with that, we've been seeing quite a bit of operation of new, new plants uh, in that market. Um, spinning reserve is basically we want a certain capacity uh, difference between what we think our major load is and what the overall generation of the facility is or the uh, uh, grid. Uh, ramp power, as you start to put um, intermittent systems, renewable energy, uh, on the system, you're going to have situations where solar panels are going to have clouds going over, so your power is there and then it's gone and then it comes back. You don't want those intermittent issues coming onto the grid, so you want to be able to slow that, that 
uh, change down onto the grid. Storage is used for that ramp rate control. Um, peak shaving, uh, a lot of times you'll have a certain amount of, we're not going to shut me off too fast there. What? <laughs> One minute? I haven't got through three slides yet. All right, let me go through this real fast then. Frequency regulation, a generator will sometimes overshoot and then not be able to be shut off. Uh, we can go up and down uh, quite a bit, but what we're trying to do with frequency regulation is match the load to the generation. Batteries are able to do that very easily. Uh, <clears throat> demand charge, uh, batteries are basically used to charge up during non-peak periods and then discharge during peak periods. A lot of the utility companies in the states are charging excess amounts for that, to meet that peak demand. So what we're able to do is use the batteries to help shave that off. Um, that issue has been primarily at the load. Some of the systems like frequency regulation are basically in the grid itself. It could be in the transmission, substation, anywhere in the distribution line. But demand charge or the, the peak demand charge uh, issue is really at the load. Um, wind. Solar, we kind of know what's going on with those. Uh, this will give you an idea on some of the ramp rate issues with solar power. As you add solar, you're getting a lot of intermittencies. Putting power on the grid, taking power off very abruptly is not good for the grid. So what we're able to do is smooth that out, firm up the grid by using energy storage, using batteries, and then firm that out quite a bit. And it smooths it out, causes fewer issues uh, for the grid. A problem with solar as well is what's called a duck curve. Uh, this came out from Cal ISO, which is the operating system for the California utility companies. Uh, this is very similar to a lot of other areas as well. We have the same problem in Hawaii. What happens is we get an excess amount of solar generation during the day, which is great, and we want to use solar to maybe replace carbon emissions, right? So the problem is, is the solar doesn't last at the peak period in the afternoon when everybody comes home, cooks their meal, cleans their clothes, and so forth. So what we're seeing now is very little fossil fuel generation during the day because the solar is there, and sometimes we have excess capacity of solar power, but then late in the evening we have an excess peak. So we're having to ramp up all of the coal fire plants, the oil fire plants, natural gas plants, and so forth at the last part of the day. Not a good thing. So we're, using, we're now looking at energy storage to store during the day, during the solar peak, and then be able to use that later in the evening. So that's load shifting. And then another thing that's a problem as well is now resiliency. Because of Hurricane Sandy that went through the northeast of the United States, uh, we had a lot of companies that had problems with diesel generators. What? All right. So anyway, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons for energy storage. There's a lot of things going on. Parker Hannafin has um, installed about 115 megawatts of energy storage last year. Uh, we've had a total of 235 megawatts of uh, energy storage inverters uh, in the market. Uh, over our time period. Uh, we would certainly like to help Brazil in the process of developing the energy storage market, and we certainly are here to uh, participate in anything we can do to assist you in that process. <laughs> Nós passamos neste momento ao debate deste primeiro painel. Para tanto, eu convido à mesa o diretor da ANEL, o senhor André Pepitone da Nóbrega, como moderador do painel, devidamente acompanhado dos expositores, Dr. Jonathan Radcliffe, do Instituto de Energia da Universidade de Birmingham, o senhor Steve Schwartz, da Parker Hanfin Corporation, e o senhor Carlos Leite Brandão, presidente da Associação Brasileira de Armazenamento e Qualidade de Energia.
tem a palavra o moderador deste debate, o senhor André Pepitoni da Nóbrega. Senhoras e senhores, bom dia a todos. Primeiro, eu destaco a, a satisfação de estar participando e também destaco o empenho da Agência Nacional de Energia Elétrica em promover, em parceria com a Embaixada Britânica, esse workshop internacional de armazenamento de tecnologia, projeto e regulação. Trata-se de um tema novo. E tudo que é inovação nos estimula, nos empolga. Então, esse evento, esse, esse, esse é um evento que eu considero que ele tem uma grande relevância no arcabouço institucional do setor elétrico brasileiro. E, sobretudo, por enfocar nessa questão do armazenamento, o armazenamento de energia, que ele permite, conforme nós podemos depender das apresentações, o armazenamento de, permite a dissociação entre a oferta de energia e a demanda de energia, que é uma novidade no, no setor. Geralmente, a, a, a geração ocorre na medida que tem demanda. Com o armazenamento, a gente quebra essa relação direta e o armazenamento, o armazenamento então, diante dessa peculiaridade, passa a ser uma ferramenta valiosa para os operadores dos sistemas elétricos. Eu cumprimento aqui meus colegas de painel, o doutor Jonathan, pela, pela excelente apresentação que fez, o Carlos Leite Brandão, presidente da Associação de Armazenamento também, e o Steve, Steve que anunciou que é a primeira vez dele aqui no Brasil, trouxe uma, um grande material, começou a, a, a apresentar né, as, exemplos práticos, questões de tecnologia, mas, infelizmente, o tempo não, não permitiu irmos com a calma necessária, mas teremos outras oportunidades. Ao longo do dia de hoje, temos ainda outros quatro painéis, e me pediram aqui também, até diante da questão do tempo, pra, para sermos céleres. Então, o que, que eu poderia é, ressaltar rapidamente dizer que o, esse drive do, do armazenamento faz parte de um projeto de inovação que estamos tratando aqui na, na regulação. Isso começou com o Smart Grid, começou com a geração distribuída descentralizada e faz parte desse arcabouço o armazenamento. E tudo isso tem um foco. Qual é esse foco? É melhorar a eficiência de uso do, do nosso sistema, aumentar o uso de fontes renováveis intermitentes no nosso sistema, o armazenamento é um drive importante, aumentar acesso à, à energia, porque o Brasil, dentro dos serviços públicos concedidos, o de energia elétrica é o que alcança o maior índice é, de todos os serviços públicos concedidos. A gente alcança o maior índice de universalização, estamos acima de 99%. Mas, é, o armazena, mas nem todo o país tem acesso ao sistema interligado nacional. Então, o armazenamento se configura uma estratégia importante né, nessas regiões do país, sobretudo naqueles sistemas isolados na região norte e alguns estados do nordeste. Rapidamente, fazer uma análise que o Brasil, no que diz respeito ao armazenamento, diferente de outras, outros países do mundo, nós temos uma situação peculiar, porque nós temos um parque de geração hídrico, e nós realizamos o armazenamento por meio dos reservatórios das usinas hidrelétricas. Então, as usinas hidrelétricas, as eólicas e a biomassa, a geração térmica oriunda da, da, cana, da biomassa de cana-de-açúcar, confere ao Brasil um status de um país de geração renovável. Com essas três fontes, nós atendemos, em anos de hidraulicidade boas, bons, mais de 90% da, da nossa carga. Então, nós... O drive do, do armazenamento, ele se constitui importante nesses sistemas é, isolados. E nós também é, estamos é, buscando é, uma, uma ênfase cada vez crescente na questão da confiança, confiabilidade da rede, na questão da estabilidade na rede, e conforme alguns dos senhores apontaram em suas apresentações, na resiliência da rede. Acho que... É, Dentro desse cenário é que a gente enfoca né, e começa, como uma casa de regulação, a tratar das políticas e da, do, da, do regulamento a ser feito, que foi muito bem observado pelo Carlos, 
na, na sua fala, de que nós precisamos, é, é, é um dos nossos desafios, é primeiro a questão da tecnologia, o que aplicar, que como vimos da, nas apresentações do ICIV e do Jonathan, está associado à capacidade de, de armazenamento, quantificar benefícios e depois desenvolver, identificar o, os drives principais para desenvolver uma regulação que torne acessível a introdução do armazenamento no nosso, no nosso setor elétrico. Mas, diante do nosso tempo aqui restrito, eu tenho aqui algumas perguntas e eu vou passar aqui para os nossos palestrantes desse primeiro painel. Então, eu podia começar aqui com o, o Jonathan, até um pouco correlato à apresentação dele, se ele pudesse nos falar também de forma bem breve e objetiva, quais são as, as tecnologias mais promissoras que se despontam no cenário mundial, fazer um paralelo dessa questão do, do custo dessa, dessa tecnologia e um ponto importante, a vida útil. Qual a vida útil dessa tecnologia de acordo com o uso, né? se é com despacho integral ou se é então para regular a tensão, frequência e a geração de energia por conexão à rede? Okay, thank you. I think, I think that's probably the hardest, hardest question because <laughs> what's the most promising technology? I, and I think it sort of touches on the, the, the other presentations that show, um, show how important it is to understand where the benefit is from energy storage. Um, and we've, we've done work on that in the UK around, uh, which I showed briefly, that, that there could be eight billion pounds worth per year Of, uh, of savings on, on the system from energy storage. And, and we're hearing that uh, similar sort of work is, is going on in Brazil and, uh, and in DOE uh, in the US. And I, I think what, what those tend to show is that there's a number of different uh, applications for energy storage uh, on different parts of the system. Uh, and by understanding where that value is, then we can begin to Uh, really identify what innovation needs to take place and what regulation needs to take place to enable them. So it's, it's, it's not really seeing that, that there is no one magic bullet. Uh, we can see the opportunities across the timescales, uh, across the different vectors of electricity and heat, uh, and in, in different locations. So now I, th there's big strides in, in lithium-ion technology, uh, and there's a publication that has shown how steeply the costs have come down. Uh, as we've seen for solar PV and with things like the Tesla Gigafactory, you can see the manufacturing being really important in driving down those costs. I think in thermal technologies, uh, there's a lot around uh, phase change materials that could make a big step change in how we store heat. Uh, and at different scales, uh, the, you know, the, the flywheels are, are commercial at the moment. Um, And you know, there's the, the still uh, and and around the technologies that we're developing in Birmingham around liquid air or you know, compressed air, that those larger scale technologies are going to be important if we're looking at renewable integration, and and they have the advantages of scaling very cheaply. So, you know, I, I think it, it's difficult to pin it down to one. I, I think there's a whole range that we need to be uh, attacking, and and that's where the international collaboration comes in because there is a lot, a lot to do. Thank you. Obrigado. Jonathan, eu vou também colocar algumas perguntas para o Steve. O Steve poderia no, nos falar sobre a questão do, do, dos fornecedores, fabricantes de equipamentos, é, assim, qual que é os países hoje que estão mais, que tem, assim, poderia apontar que estão mais avançados com essa tecnologia. E qual que é a, a escala de aplicação dessa tecnologia, considerando a viabilidade técnica, técnico-econômica de grandes blocos, GD, ou sistema híbridos de fontes intermitentes? O que é, é mais aplicado? E, e, e onde é aplicada essa tecnologia? Por uh, most part, um, Parker's been involved uh, since very early in the frequency regulation market. Our inverters uh, that we manufacture Uh, are primarily used for the DC to AC conversion for batteries. We really don't get into a lot of some of the other technologies, although we can help facilitate wind, we can facilitate uh, solar, we can facilitate uh, flywheel technology to some extent. 
Um, the scale that we go uh, right now, we've had systems that are in the 32 megawatt range that are being used for frequency regulation. Uh, last year I sold over 50 megawatts of uh, frequency regulation systems. Uh, we've got a number of systems that are uh, around the world. Uh, we've got a 20 megawatt system in Chile that's being used for um, uh, extra capacity uh, on the system. Uh, so we, we've got a lot of different things. What we're finding, though, is that due to uh, cost, uh, being able to fund projects, uh, regulatory issues, a lot of the, the uh, market has now moved to the customer side of the market. So we're seeing smaller systems being used now at the customer load. Uh, and those are to address peak shaving opportunities. And now because a lot of these businesses are putting in solar, they're having voltage issues and our inverters are able to handle that. So we're seeing, from, from our perspective, we're seeing a lot in the battery space uh, due to the cost of the lithium batteries coming down. And it's being moved across the board uh, from large scale opportunities down to the smallest customer. Ou seja, é uma tecnologia que está avançando, mas hoje ela está concentrada nos consumidores de, digamos assim, de pequena demanda, até por questões de custo. Um, on the PV side, uh, we're putting in gigawatts worth of solar around the world, um, and we have inverters that uh, are providing power for that, but most of the inverters uh, for that market are coming out of Europe and, and so forth. Um, but no, it's not, not just commercial or not just customers and not mm -hmm. residentials. Uh, we're seeing this as commercial industrial uh, operations are putting in these solar systems, and we're seeing a lot of large-scale systems as well. Okay. E o Carlos Leite Brandão, na sua apresentação, sempre muito preocupado com a questão de incentivo, regulação. Carlos, o que você poderia é, nos apontar hoje no nosso cenário? Quais seriam as principais barreiras regulatórias para a gente avançar? E quais que seriam os incentivos hoje desejáveis para a gente conseguir avançar com o armazenamento? Bom, é... em em que pese que nós vamos falar de tarde, mais de regulação, na, a preocupação nossa nesse momento é tentar entender que as coisas não andam descasadas. Né? Falar de tecnologia, em primeiro lugar, é que nós consigamos falar de aplicação daquilo que hoje já comercialmente existe. Uhum. Por que, que eu faço essa introdução? É, eu vi um artigo recente que se gasta tri, é, em 3 a 4 anos nos Estados Unidos 1,3 bilhões em armazenamento de energia, de 800 a 900 milhões com DOE, e tem outras instituições mexendo com isso. A, a nossa preocupação em falar de tecnologia se dá em dois pontos. Primeiro, é, nós precisamos de revitalização, me, revitalizar o mercado de engenharia no Brasil em termos de usinas, tá? que tem potencial, inclusive exporta usina reversível para fora do, do país. Esse é o um primeiro ponto. É, a grande barreira aqui não é uma, é uma barreira é, não só regulatória, mas é uma barreira quase que institucional em reverter essa aplicação a nível de país. É, para aplicação no grid, sendo mais objetivo na sua pergunta, nós temos que criar condições de ter serviços ancilares, tá? é, quantificar e ter benefícios, porque isso não pode ser precificado da mesma forma que eu pago hoje a nível de qualquer outro serviço. Tá? E temos também que ter um processo é, de é, criar uma cadeia a nível de indústria nacional, principalmente para bateria. Por que, que eu falo isso? Até recentemente eu fui presidente de uma empresa de é, energia renovável e colocamos muita eólica no país. Foi muito difícil, junto aos fornecedores, que hoje já se instalaram no, no, no Brasil, é, a, o critério de nacionalização de aerogeradores no país. É, são critérios que às vezes têm é, percepções diferentes e têm timings diferentes. Então, nós precisamos, em primeiro momento, criar uma escala de consumo industrial no Brasil, porque o Brasil ocupa uma posição estratégica. Imagina, os senhores, que 60% das reservas de lítio do mundo estão colocadas na América Latina. E nós poderíamos ter uma indústria nacional a curto e médio prazo que permitisse tudo isso. Então, é, do ponto de vista de, de grid, as barreiras regulatórias são principalmente a nível de serviços ancilares. Falando a nível de medidor, nós temos que criar condições regulatórias para a demanda resposta pela parte do consumidor, resposta pelo lado da demanda pelo lado do consumidor, e é, aquilo que já está sendo feito em termos de microgrid, 
ilhamentos de excelência que têm sido muito utilizados aí fora. Você isola uma parte de um sistema de distribuição hiperlítica que aquela parte tenha, qualidade, é, tenha continuidade durante uma interrupção e poder, possamos criar também essas condições de é, igualar a, a resposta pelo lado da demanda, demand response, a outras soluções para o sistema. Se enquanto no grid uma solução de armazenamento é 16 vezes, 17 vezes mais eficiente e rápida do que um, uma térmica de ciclo aberto, tá? que já traz uma série de vantagens, do lado da demanda o consumidor precisa de qualidade, nós hoje estamos tendo uma fuga de grandes bases de dados para outros países, inclusive por causa de qualidade, e aonde é que, do ponto de vista de consumidor, isso faz todo o sentido é, em tecnologias de armazenamento de energia, e a gente tem que trabalhar nisso. Eu me preocupo um pouco, aí falando diretamente aí, para o regulador, é que hoje nós focamos muito... Uh, o problema da qualidade de energia, sem é, entrar muito no mérito, no DEC e no FEC. Mais no DEC do que no FEC, e estamos esquecendo que as interrupções abaixo de três ou de um minuto, elas têm uma importância crucial para processos de produção cada vez mais sofisticados no mundo, e então o consumidor tem que ter esse tipo de incentivo. É, passou rápido na apresentação, eu não sei se alguns dos senhores acompanhou Uh, o processo que aconteceu nos Estados Unidos, no FERC, quando da famosa resolução 745, que incentivou a resposta pelo lado da demanda. É, principalmente na PJM, isso teve muito sucesso em termos de vantagens para o consumidor, que assim contribuía com isso. É, isso teve disputa judicial até esse ano, em fevereiro, a Suprema Corte Americana deu ganho de causa para o FERC naquilo que ele estava estabelecendo. É um processo tremendo de vencer barreiras regulatórias para que isso possa acontecer. Ok, Carlos, muito obrigado. Eu tenho uma pergunta que veio do auditório, o senhor até mencionou na sua fala, que diz o seguinte, a preocupação é como é que o fornecimento de material, e aqui o foco é no lítio, que é o, o principal agregado da, da cadeia, é, pode, ele se apresenta como uma barreira para o armazenamento de energia. Deixa a pergunta aberta para... Senhores, eu vou dar um detalhe aqui. Todos vocês devem ter acompanhado um, lançamento, um, um anúncio em escala mundial, não foi localizado, da bateria residencial da Tesla. Independente de qualquer coisa, eu não estou entrando no mérito, foi uma, um, um, um movimento de marketing muito bem orquestrado, que mereceu, inclusive, editorial da Folha de São Paulo num domingo. Eu não guardei, mas alguns de vocês devem ter lido. É, logo depois disso, a Panasonic anunciou a, a remoção das fábricas dela do Japão para a Austrália para ficar perto da, da, das fontes de lítio. O Brasil tem todas as condições de criar uma cadeia de produção nesse setor. A cadeia de produção não é pura e simplesmente a bateria. Esse é um dos temas que a gente tem que abordar primeiro regulatoriamente e depois é, fora daqui. Ah, é necessário incentivar a parte de inversores, da parte de produção de controle, essa parte toda que está nascendo, para que a gente consiga montar o elo da cadeia e só depois a gente ter condição de usar as reservas de lítio da Bolívia e do Chile que estão do nosso lado. Então, eu acho que esse é um movimento estratégico a ser feito a nível industrial para a nacionalização. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I think that there's, there's certainly um, a great opportunity if, if there is an effort to build uh, lithium batteries here. A large part of the cost of lithium is going to be the scale. Uh, Tesla has certainly proven that with the uh, Gigafactory that they're working on. Um, as far as lithium batteries uh, applications, we're seeing this in cars, we're seeing this in our home electronics. That's what's driving the cost down. And as much as we can use cost-effective solutions for energy storage, we're going to see applications that make sense. Um, a lot of the, the battery applications also can be a load as well as a generation source. So there's a lot of opportunities there. So as far as what's impediment, I don't know. It seems to me to be the... the a good technology to be using right now. Ok, senhores, para encerrar esse painel, eu vou...
Para encerrar esse painel, eu vou conceder um minuto e eu peço que se detenham apenas, a, de fato, um minuto para o Steve, para o Jonathan e para o Carlos, para que possam apresentar qual é a perspectiva para o futuro da, do armazenamento de energia. Quais os desafios, né? Uh, from my perspective, uh, I think that uh, energy storage has got a huge opportunity uh, in the future. I think costs are certainly an issue, uh, regulation is certainly an issue. Uh, we need to better understand the applications. Um, I don't know that that's actually being seen yet, as we certainly have seen more solar being added to the network. We're seeing more problems are, are coming up. Uh, our distribution system in the states was, was really designed for one-way flow uh, of power and now we're seeing generation at the end of the line uh, at the customer level and coming back onto the grid. That's creating voltage problems and that's causing new regulation on how you use smarter inverters that can control frequency and voltage. Uh, so we're learning a lot. There's new technology certainly and more of the future energy storage applications are going to be more focused on long duration storage. So maybe tech lithium may not be the perfect uh, opportunity for the future. Uh, there may be other technologies that come up that are lower cost. Certainly, we're, we're willing to, to accept those opportunities as well. But from Parker's perspective, uh, we see the great opportunity, and we're certainly willing to help in any way we can. Thank you. Well, I, I think I'd uh, urge everyone to think about the whole system, really, uh, thinking not just about electricity, but about uh, heat, cold, power, and how that integrates into other parts of uh, society, you know, so also thinking about food uh, and transport uh, and trying to construct most efficient systems w within that uh, within that landscape rather than being too narrow and taking a longer term view because uh, we need to be thinking about long term efficient systems, uh, not getting locked into short term decisions that, that might be cheaper right now. So th th there are some opportunities that, that we should shouldn't miss and, and part of this feeds on from, from that last question about lithium, uh, we've got to think about you know, the end of, end of life as well for, for lithium uh, and that's an area that hasn't been really well analysed uh, because we could have a lot of uh, batteries that are sitting around. We might need to engineer them so that they can be uh, recycled more, more efficiently. Um minuto. Custos caem, bateria de lítio cai 50% nos próximos cinco anos, bateria de chumbo 25%. O grande desafio é a quantificação e identificação de uso e benefícios, não só para postergação de investimentos e serviços ancilares, como também não se esqueçam que a médio prazo nós vamos ter um problema terrível de distribuição, porque nós vamos introduzir o conceito de carga móvel à medida que a gente vai ter carro elétrico mais dia, menos dia, rodando para aí com um grande problema de operação, inclusive a nível de distribuição. É, o processo de regulação é o processo crucial nesse contexto de armazenamento de energia para uso, quer seja pelo consumidor, quer seja pelo, pelo grid. Tá? E, finalmente, criar uma cadeia de P&D nacional e uma cadeia de industrialização de partes nacionais com incentivos e um planejamento de curto, médio e longo prazo. Obrigado. Muito obrigado. Diante dessas considerações, então, encerramos o nosso primeiro painel desse workshop. Agradeço a valorosa contribuição do Steve, do Jonathan e do Carlos no trabalho aqui do primeiro painel. Muito obrigado. Senhoras e senhores, nós teremos agora um brevíssimo intervalo para o café de apenas 10 minutos. O café será servido no primeiro andar, ao lado da exposição O Futuro de uma Sede Eficiente e Sustentável que trata do projeto de eficiência energética a ser realizado nos próximos, me próximos meses aqui nas instalações da ANEL. Contamos com a colaboração de todos, no sentido de retornarem dentro de 10 minutos. Bom café a todos.